There is a line in Paul Celan's Death Fugue that does not give me peace. The poem describes a man who lives in a concentration camp. He's not an inmate. He's a guard, or perhaps even the camp commander. He's not any specific person, but an embodiment, a representation of all the guards, all the commanders. During the day, he shoots the prisoners, sicks his hounds on them, promises death. During the night, he rides home to Germany, to a woman, perhaps his wife or lover. Your golden hair, Margarete, he waxes poetically in his letter. But that is not the line I am thinking about. The moral schizophrenia displayed by the perpetrators of the National Socialist regime never quite loses its sting. But I am thinking about something else. A man lives in the house, your golden hair, Margarete. He sets his dogs on us, he gifts us a grave in the air, he plays with the snakes and dreams. He dreams. What does he dream of? What kind of future does he hope for? In the name of what vision did he cripple his soul? In 1946, American journalist Rebecca West arrives in the ruins which were once the city of Nuremberg to witness one of the most famous trials to ever take place. Fascism was on the dock. She and the other female journalists were lodged in a villa located outside the city, which had become the home of an incredibly wealthy pencil manufacturer, Faber Castell. The villa was striking, and according to West it was among the curious results of an excessive preoccupation with fairy tales. For that was the dream behind all this villa building. It revealed itself clearly in this schloss. Its turret windows were quite useless, unless Rapunzel was to let down her hair from them. Its odd upper rooms, sliced into queer shapes by the intemperate steepness of the tiled roof, could be fitly occupied only by a fairy godmother with a spinning wheel. The staircase was for the descent of a prince and princess that should live happily ever after. It was perhaps the greatest misfortune of the German people that their last genius, Wagner, who flowered at the same time as their political integration, their military conquests and their industrial hegemony, and who has never had his domination over them so much as threatened by any succeeding artist, should have kept so close to the fairy tale in his greatest works. It is as if Shakespeare had confirmed the hold of Dick Whittington and Jack and the Beanstalk on the English mind, and it means that the German imagination was at once richly fecundated and bound to a primitive fantasy dangerous for civilized adults. The National Socialists took a fairy tale to a nauseating extreme. In their story, which was supposed to be the greatest German epic, the people of the Aryan race, especially the Germans, were the heroes, chosen not by a capricious god, but by nature itself, all capable and all deserving, the pinnacle of humanity. But to fulfill this dream and to pass it on to their children so they could carry it further to completion over the centuries, they would have to destroy everyone else. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, the plan was clear. Poland would be sucked dry of food, fuel and manpower to sustain Germany and shield it from the effects of the war and allow it to achieve the so-called final victory. Once the dust had settled, the Poles would be completely enslaved. They would not be given more than the most elementary education at best, and future generations would be raised to worship the Aryan race and to accept their enslavement as the natural order of things. And once the Aryan population would grow, these Polish slaves would be banished from Poland and deported to the east, until the day when the Aryan race would need even more space to live, at which these subhumans, as they were considered, would be at the receiving end of a more permanent solution. It was only through great suffering, courage and sacrifice that this cancerous fairy tale was not allowed to reach its blood-stained final page. But Poland felt the devastated force of its beginning. Its elites were decimated, 
its industry was hijacked, its population was starved and enslaved. It is impossible to depict the scale of this catastrophe. I can give you numbers and show you graves or read you letters, but I cannot show it all. Instead, I am going to show you one story. It will have to carry all the others. A man lives in the house. He plays with the snakes and he dreams. The story begins in the spring of 1925, in the village of Falkow, a speck on the map of south-central Poland. The village was emerging from a difficult time. It had been destroyed completely during the First World War and had even lost its pride and joy, the ancient church. In the years after the war, the village rebuilt itself little by little, but life continued to be a series of gasps for air in a sea of poverty. Unemployment, hunger, epidemics and a general lack of opportunities formed the daily reality for most people there. On the 2nd of April of that year, Josef Rubel, a roofer, and his wife Marianne welcomed their first child, a boy they christened Valerian. The name comes from Latin and it means healthy, strong, every loving parent's prayer for their child. Marianne took to motherhood exceptionally well. She was warm, caring, and adored her little son. Due to his profession as a roofer, Josef Rubel was away from home six days out of seven, so Marianne and little Valerian would spend most of their time together. What she may have lacked in finances, Marianne made up with love. She had no money to buy her son toys, nobody in the village had, but she compensated by spoiling him like only a mother could. Over the years, Two more children were born to the Vrubels, a son and a daughter, and they were quite a happy family. Almost as if to compensate for the fact that he missed April Fool's Day when he was born, Valerian turned out to be a fond prankster. He loved to play tricks and practical jokes on people, some innocent, others a bit mischievous. He would smear dirt on doorknobs, climb on a bell rope of the church and monkey around, driving the priest to hysterics. One time, he ran past an old Jewish merchant and smeared a handful of pitch onto his long beard. He had a big personality, was vivacious and active, in spite of his diminutive size. School was not something he was terribly fond of. He was a rather poor student. He particularly couldn't wrap his head around counting. He sometimes joked that he found school so difficult because it was uphill and he had sand in his bag. He was held back for two years and eventually had to leave school after the fourth grade because he had aged out of the system. Although, to be fair, there was an element of bad luck involved there. One of those lost years was caused by a bout of typhus that he suffered from. He was lovingly nursed back to health by his mother. But the sickness left its mark. He would never grow to be big and strong like the root of his name. He was a delicate boy small and slender, barely reaching 1 meter 60. Like all children from the village, Valerian helped his family with various chores. As the eldest child, he had a special responsibility in that respect. After school, he and his friend Czesław Dombrowski would take the family cows to graze. Czesław recalled in a letter written in 1984 that we had a lot of mischief in our heads. We unpegged the cows and rushed them across the pastures and we both always ran after them. In spite of the constant mischief swirling around his head, Valerian spent most of his life in Falkov not getting in any serious trouble, with one particular exception. One day, he saw a bicycle outside a village church. Unfortunately for him, at that moment he happened to be a 14-year-old boy with all the modest capacity for things like common sense and thinking things through, typical of the age. And so, while the unsuspecting owner was listening to the service, Valerian took the bicycle apart and threw it in a well. In a time and place where cars were a rarity, a bicycle was a precious mode of transportation and the owner must have been furious. The police nabbed our protagonist immediately 
and sent him to the courthouse. He stayed in arrest for three days as punishment. Cheswav remembered this very clearly because Valerian had told the police that he was also with him during the act, and so he had to go to the judge and proclaim his innocence. But their friendship does not seem to have been dampened by that, and Cheswav would later remember those days and his friend with affection. One day, at the beginning of September 1939, just as Mariana Vrubel was getting a loaf of freshly baked bread out of the oven, a bomb fell on their house. The German warplanes were attacking the tiny village, setting the houses on fire and gunning down the fleeing survivors. In a blind panic, the Vrubels grabbed what they could and ran for the safety of the woods. The children got separated from their parents and found shelter with other villagers until they could be reunited days later. When the family returned, the house had burned down completely. The precious few photographs they had and other family mementos such as letters and postcards were lost in the blaze. They improvised a shack in the blackened ruins and later, when the cold season made living there unbearable and dangerous, they went to live with an acquaintance in the neighbouring village. The Germans were not kind masters. They demanded that the villagers hand over their harvest, registered all the animals and forbid their owners to slaughter them for meat. They closed down the mill, banned the population from grinding any cereals in private and organized constant raids to destroy improvised grinding instruments. The starving villagers were reduced to eating anything at all to survive, from herbs to potato peels. The Germans also demanded a certain number of men who were to go to Germany as workers to sustain the German economy. It was not a request, but an order, although officially these labourers were unanimously described as volunteers. The village leader went to every family which had more than one son and named the young men and boys who had to go. Valerian, who was barely 16 at the time, had a brother and so did his friend Cheswav and so both were selected to go to Germany. They were not told the truth, that what they were heading towards was essentially slave labour. There was almost nothing left of the village. The school had been destroyed, there was nothing to do. It appears that in order to get the boys to leave without a fuss, they were promised that they will be able to earn some money to send home. This certainly seems to have been what Valerian believed, as his little sister, who was only eight at the time, remembered. And my mother did not want to let him leave. She wanted to keep him by her side. But he said, when I am there, I can send you money. He wanted to help the family. Josef and Mariana reluctantly packed their son's bag, advised him to behave and stay out of trouble, and hugged him goodbye. Cheswav remembers what followed. Valerian and I, we were on the same transport. They took us to the city in horse-drawn carts, at the employment office they had no interest in people at all. We were all crowded in one room, they hardly looked at our papers and we went straight to the doctor. But that was not a real doctor. He only looked to see if someone had ulcers or rashes and then we were already taken further into the bathroom and through to disinfection. The boys were loaded up on a train overfilled with people. The travellers were not given water, just half a loaf of brown bread. For one full day and night, the train crawled its way to Germany, through Berlin, then Brunswick and Hanover. The two friends had managed to stay together through the entire process, and they were promised in the employment office that they would not be separated, but in Hanover this promise was broken. The train was emptied, the men were given a watery soup and a slice of bread, and they were ordered to line up. Quick, quick! If someone was a little slower, then they came right away with kicks and rubber truncheons. But all the time I kept close to Valerian, always standing in a row close to each other. Then, show your papers. When they saw my papers, the command came immediately. Come on, move over, into the other column. But I didn't want to. I took Valerian by the hand and wanted to pull him over with me. Oh, I don't know what the gendarmes shouted. I couldn't understand the German language. Not a word at the time. I immediately received a rubber truncheon over my hand and had to let go, and with kicks I was driven over to the other column. They marched off and I turned around and saw him standing there. After that, I never saw him again. We were still children. 
We did not know that we would be driven to such hard work. Valerian arrived on the 19th of April 1941 in Bremen, barely 16, naive, uncertain, and a world away from home. He had never traveled so far away from his village. He did not speak a single word of German. The food, the weather, the language, the people, the houses, the habits, the laws, all were foreign to him. National Socialism was foreign to him. The farm where he was sent as a forced labourer belonged to a widow by the name of Meta Martens. She lived there with her two daughters, Louisa and Alma, and a younger son. After the death of her husband, Mrs. Martens found herself in a predicament. Her daughters could not compensate for the physical strength of a regular farm labourer. Her son was only 15, and the old man-servant they had was not strong enough to keep the farm running. Therefore, she applied to the employment office for a volunteer from Poland so that her farm could survive. It was a wealthy farm, with many cows and a large garden. One of the indicators of wealth from back then has still been preserved, according to one of their descendants. The numerous high-quality personal photographs belonging to the family. Photography, especially high-quality photography, was expensive back then, and poor people could not afford it. Valerian was surely a disappointment to Mrs. Martens. Small, barely 160, thin and delicate, he was not a strong worker Mrs. Martens needed for the farm, but she had no choice. She and the rest of her family did not speak Polish, of course, and therefore had great trouble communicating with the boy. Within days, Valerian began to miss his family terribly. He had never been away from them for so long before, and he loved them more than anything in the world. He could not even tell anyone about how he felt because nobody could speak his language. The one Polish forced laborer from the neighboring farm was not kind to him. He was all alone in his sorrow. Sometimes Mrs. Martens could see him cry. She assumed, correctly, that he was homesick. Valerian was unprepared for the kind of work assigned to him. It was much harder than anything he had done at home. It was work meant for a healthy, strong man. He did not like the food, another element of the culture shock he had been confronted with since his arrival. He also received less bread than the rest of the family. His clothing was insufficiently warm for the icy weather sweeping northern Germany. The Martinsons did not appear to take pity on him on that particular matter. Desolate, he wrote a letter to his parents, begging them to get him out of there. He was sick and hungry and cold. The letter broke his mother's heart. She could not go to him to get him back. She had no money, lived in a ruined village, but she was not quite powerless. She had few possessions, but one of these was a blanket. Together with a neighbor, she cut the blanket into pieces, dyed them, and made a suit for her son. She knew his measurements by heart. He grew up in her arms. She sent the suit to Bremen. Nobody knows if it ever arrived, if Valerian ever knew what his mother had done for him. There was no question of money, of course. Valerian probably discovered quickly that he had been lied to by the Polish authorities, just so that he and many others would get on those transports without a fuss. The only compensation he would receive for his back-breaking labor was food and board, and nothing more. The only reason why he had agreed to leave his home and his family was now gone, something which must have contributed greatly to the distress he was feeling. Mrs. Martens grew quickly frustrated with Valerian. The boy did not work hard enough, and when he did work, he had to always be supervised because, according to her, as soon as he was alone, he stopped. Desperate to leave the situation he was in, Valerian patched together an escape plan. He built himself a rucksack out of an old corn sack, where he placed whatever he thought would help him his own shabby and torn jacket, a pair of brown shoes, a pair of sandals, a pair of bicycle tubes and a leather shoulder protector for carrying wood. Additionally, he stored in his room a pair of solid work shoes which had belonged to the widow's husband. He wanted to use the bicycle tubes to make rubber bands for suspenders and the leather he intended to use for soling his shoes. It would have been cleverer to simply make a note of where the things normally were and collect them all in one fell swoop before making his escape attempt, but he was inexperienced in such matters and his stash was quickly uncovered 
by Mrs. Martins on the 25th of April. The language barrier prevented her from having a conversation with him, so she simply placed the shoes on Valerian's chair at breakfast so that he would know that his plan had been discovered. In fact, the following morning at mealtime, the Paul also noticed the shoes. He didn't say a word, but he couldn't look at us either. Apparently, he was ashamed. Crushed, Valerian went back to his work, but his despair quickly gave way to anger. He threw the tool in his hand to the ground. Worried that the boy might try to run away, Mrs. Martins and her daughters kept their eyes glued to him. Suddenly, around 10.30, Valerian was nowhere to be found. After intensive searches, the women found out that he had left the farm in an attempt to head home. They called the police. Valerian might not have been a great asset in their eyes, but they needed his labor. A Polish forced laborer from a nearby farm brought him back. The police arrived and reminded the boy of his duties, as the widow wrote in her statement. On a Tuesday of the 29th of April, after an afternoon on the field, Valerian was sent back to the farm for more work. When the widow and her daughter returned to the house at four o'clock, they could not find the pole, as they called him, and so they began looking for him. Then, suddenly, the daughter cried out, Oh, mother, the barn is burning! The mother immediately ran in front of the house and shouted for help from her neighbors. Suddenly, she saw Valerian, who tried talking to her in Polish. She could not understand what he was saying, but she suspected him of being the source of the fire. I grabbed him by the shoulder and shook him, because I suspected him of being the culprit. Vrubel now went down the hall with me to the pump. While I was pumping, he took the full buckets and went with them to the source of the fire. What is striking here is that, although he did not know German, he knew immediately what to do with the water and found the source of the fire without any help or instructions. According to the rest of her statement, the material damages were small, but the fright they received from the incident was great. What had caused Valerian to commit such a dangerous act? The reason he would give is that he hoped that he would be released from his position and sent back to his parents. He appears to have thought that if he burned down the barn, there would be no more work left for him and he would therefore not be needed any anymore. A terrible decision and a fatal misstep in judgment, caused by his profound homesickness and desperate situation. The Martisans did not feel safe with Valerian under their roof anymore, and so the widow told the police what had happened. This decision has been seen with different eyes over the decades. One perspective is that it is uncertain whether Mrs. Martins and her daughter would have suspected the fate that awaited Valerian, and anybody would feel unsafe living with someone who had once tried to burn down their barn, especially when the barn was connected to their house. But there are some who think that they should have tried to be more understanding and forgiving with him, and that includes Stefan Vega, the great-grandson of Louisa Martins. In an interview with Annette Schumann on the 2nd of November 2021 in Berlin, he explained, They could well have said, that was an accident that happened to my daughter, instead of calling in the Gestapo. And finally, they also specifically called the police, testified, and also repeated their statements in court. And this happened at a time when you already knew, or at least could guess, what was going to happen. That very day, the Bremen police sent a letter to the Gestapo detailing the events. Valerian was transferred to the custody of the Gestapo, who interrogated him on the 2nd of May. Valerian had probably never been in a more terrifying situation since the day German planes bombed his village. He was scared and cried during the proceedings. On the 5th of May 1941, his mugshot was taken and his physical description was written down. Slim figure, dark blonde hair, grey-brown eyes. It's difficult to say what Valerian might have been thinking in that moment. Did he still hope that he would be sent back to his parents? It was very unlikely that he was aware of the seriousness of his situation, of the terrifying machine whose gears were already starting to grind, ready to send him through the ice-cold bowels of a system which did not see any value in him. On the 9th of June, the police doctor wrote the following racial evaluation. Vrubel is of small stature. The head is almost spherical and falls steeply backwards. The cheekbones, zygomatic arches, are prominent. 
The forehead is broad and arched, the crown is high, the mouth is small, the chin not very pronounced. The color of the face is pale yellowish, the height is 160 centimeters. Vrubel is of the eastern type. This is bad news for Valerian, but a handwritten edition gave a glimmer of hope. Somebody added at the end of this racial evaluation that this should be of no consequence in terms of criminal law. The author of this remark was prosecutor Dr. Zander, who was responsible for juvenile criminal cases. But his insistence that justice remained blind and impartial was struck out by the thick pencil scribble of Dr. Zeidel, head prosecutor, who checked the files of his underlings and corrected them if he felt it necessary. His message was clear. This is not how the story goes anymore. Valerian was also not legally regarded as a forced labourer. Aside the prisoners of war, all the other forced labourers were considered by the justice system as willing volunteers. They worked for food. Nobody forced them to come to the Reich. The intentional, cold-blooded, German-induced starvation of Poland was of no concern to the Gestapo. At the end of the interrogation, Valerian was asked to provide a handwriting sample. And this is the first time that we actually hear the boy in his own words. The statement taken by the Gestapo with the help of an interpreter was cold and impersonal. My name is Vrubal Valerian. I was born on the 2nd of April in the year 1925. And I went six years to school. The school certificate is home with our parents. We are three children a brother and sister and me the eldest. The interpreter could not help himself but correct Valerian's spelling mistakes with red ink. The criminal investigation department gathered extensive evidence. Not only are Valerian's movements exceptionally well documented with the use of crime scene photographs, but they even saved the matchbox he tore to pieces and discarded in the garden. It's still there, even today, in the archives, in an old yellow envelope. On the 20th of June, the Gestapo stepped in and sent Valerian to the Neuengamme concentration camp. Historian Schmink Gustavus writes that the Gestapo appearing in prisons and pre-trial detention centers to pick up prisoners was nothing unusual at the time. Such cases were handled by the SS and Gestapo in their own jurisdiction. This meddling of the Gestapo would have normally caused irritation between them and the judicial branch, who fiercely resented the intrusion over their authority. But in this case, nobody seems to have particularly cared where or for how long Valerian was imprisoned while waiting for his day in court. In the end, he was just a Polish boy. The word Pole, followed by an exclamation mark, appears handwritten on several pages of his painstakingly compiled file to warn whoever comes into contact with it in the course of this nightmarish mixture of judicial procedure and Gestapo arbitrariness, what kind of treatment is expected to be applied to him. Neuengamme was built in 1938 in northern Germany and grew into the largest camp there with over a hundred thousand prisoners passing through its main camp and subcamps. The idea behind it began with a man who, much like the figure in Paul Celan's death fugue, lived in a house in Berlin and dreamed. Adolf Hitler's ambition to transform Hamburg, one of the five so-called Führer cities, according to his grandiose design. The completed project would have included a 250-meter skyscraper, an enormous domed hall and a high bridge over the Elbe River. The mission of Neuengamme was to produce clinker bricks for this enormous expansion and reconstruction project. As far as research shows today, almost 43,000 people perished in murderous Neuengamme. In 1985, historian Schmink Gustavus searched among the Polish survivors of the camp for anyone who might have met Valerian. There was not much hope in this endeavor, but he persisted and wrote letters upon letters. During one meeting of former inmates in Warsaw, his letter was read aloud and Valerian's photograph was circulated. A little while later, the historian received a surprising letter from Poland, from a man called Michał Piotrowski. He recognized Valerian. Michał was born in 1923. He began writing down his memories as soon as he returned home to Warsaw in 1945. As a memory aid, he had numerous tiny pieces of cigarette paper filled with notes. He had written them in Neuengamme, rolled up and hidden in the seam of his jacket, 
an illicit stash of names, dates, and details. Crumbs saved from the oblivion which had threatened to engulf him and his compatriots. I called him Valerik, said Mihao, in good but hesitant German. It was a small one, perhaps one meter sixty. I was two years older, born in 1923, but there were even younger ones. One boy, he was 14. He too came from a farmer. He ran away because he was homesick. Most of them were young in that commando. Many, so many, were under 18. Both boys were part of the so-called Elbe Commando. The goal of this group was to build a channel between the brick factory and the Dover Elbe River, so that the transport of the Finnish bricks may be accomplished via ship. Back then, when I came, May 41, it was still long before the Kling factory. It went like this. There's a dredger on the water in the canal, and it throws the mud onto the banks, to the left, to the right. That's the only machine in the command. Everything else is done by hand, prisoner labor. We stand on the edge, on the bank. Everyone has a shovel, and we shovel away the earth that the dredger has thrown down. But where? So you know, that's how it is. Some have the shovel, others have the wheelbarrow. And those with the shovel shovel it onto the wheelbarrow, and then the earth goes up onto the slope where it has to be leveled. It's such a circle with the wheelbarrows, always moving, always moving. You can't stop, you can't rest. We push the carts on such supports, you know, boards, to where they are dumped, then back without stopping, further in the ring, back to the prisoners with the shovel. Earth on top of the cart again, further in the ring, dumping on top and so on. No one is allowed out of the ring from morning to noon and from noon to evening, and you are not allowed to sit down for a moment. The couples and four men are standing next to you. The second group works with the lorries. They run on rails, you know, iron rails. The wagons are used when a lot of earth is removed, over a long distance. The third group works with spades on the shore, and they advance with the dredger. They stand in the water and level the embankment, because the dredger doesn't work so cleanly but the embankment has to be smooth. And the prisoners stand in the mud and dig through the earth with shovels to make it even, regardless of the month, whether December or July, it is relevant, always with the feet in the water. And many fell ill. It's normal. When you are standing in the water with wet clothes, you become sick. The one in the water is the hardest command. You could not survive it for long. But some people get money from home, give it to the capo, and then maybe they get a better commando and are treated more gently. But all the others are driven, brutally and ruthlessly, without compassion. There was another commander on the Elbe, a punishment commando. We were in it. That was the hardest work. We had to balance over such a footbridge with fully loaded pushcarts and move the earth to the other bank. The canal is wide, maybe eight meters. There are only two narrow planks over it and a floating box in the middle. That's where you have to cross with your cart. It's wobbly, and you're not wearing shoes. You've got these lumps of wood where you can't hold on. Sometimes that happens, and the wheelbarrow goes off in the wrong direction, falls down into the water, but you can't go without it. You have to jump off the jetty immediately and save it. I was with Valerek in the command, always behind him with my wheelbarrow. Valerian was assigned to this commando because he was suspected to be a saboteur, which was seen as worse than a simple arsonist. At that point, no trial had taken place, and the boy himself never gave any indication that his unwise gesture was motivated by a hatred of Germans or by any political ideology. The retrieval of the wheelbarrow from the water posed a serious problem. Not only would a plunge in the ice-cold waters during the cold months severely lower one's chances of survival, but it could mean the end for the prisoners who could not swim. If the wheelbarrow fell into the water, it had to be retrieved, regardless of whether the prisoner could swim or not. One day, Valerian lost control of his heavy wheelbarrow and watched it as it disappeared into the murky waters of the canal. He had no choice but to jump after it. But Valerian could not swim. The canal was two meters deep, and he was barely one meter sixty. The water was dirty, he could not see anything. He could not use the bottom of the canal to push himself upwards, the thick layer of mud at its bottom made the feet sink. Mihao watched as the waters under which Valerian had disappeared began to still. And I took my own wheelbarrow, quickly, quickly, and threw it into the water as well, and jumped after him. I was a swimmer. First, I got Valeric out. 
Then I threw one of the wheelbarrows onto the shore, and then the other. From then on, you know, we stayed together always, walked one after the other. Michal had done something amazing. He had saved Valerian's life. It was not just an act of heroism, but one of profound humanity in a merciless, dog-eats-dog -dog environment designed to grind down and exterminate any shred of compassion, any morsel of altruism. Many were so wholly, so desperately occupied with their own survival that Michal's gesture shines as an example of the nobility of the human soul. Michal took Valerian under his wing and taught him how to survive in the camp. He told him who to avoid, warned him to never eat anything from the trash bins next to the kitchen, no matter how hungry he might have been, as they were a sure source of typhus, described what roots and leaves were edible. Valerian was very young, very naive. He had no experience whatsoever. He was so naive that if you told him that this and this is true, or this is how things go in the concentration camp, he would believe you immediately. You had to be brutal to survive, not naive, and, and Valerik was always so, oh, so naive. He always spoke about his parents, about his sister, about school. Even with Michal's guidance and help, Valerian became terribly ill after a while. He was starving, his small body was covered in bruises from all the hits he received, and he was suffering from anxiety. There was no room for him in the unsanitary, ill-equipped camp hospital. His saving angel was Dr. Mittelstedt, an inmate from Warsaw, who, in spite of the dog-eat-dog -dog situation which occurred as a natural consequence of living in the camp, stayed true to the tenets of his profession and brought Valerian twice from the brink of death. Another thing Michal noticed about his friend was his religious awakening. His childhood friend Cheswav would distinctly remember that growing up, Valerian did not have much to do with God, but that seemed to change in the camp. Abandoned there to die by the Gestapo, far away from his family, Valerian reached out to the only higher power who he hoped would listen to him. The boy was pious, he had religion, and when he did not speak about his parents, he always returned to the topic of freedom. When will I come out? He was scared and thought about what he could do to get out of the camp. And he missed his parents so desperately. He was more worried about them than about himself. He wanted so much to return to them. But he was scared that he would not survive, always scared. The prisoners generally did not talk about the reasons why they were in the camp. But one evening, Valerian told Michał and another Polish inmate by the name of Lutek about the reason for his imprisonment that he had hoped that by doing poor work, or no work, he would be sent home. And when that failed, he started a fire in the barn, hoping that this would be the last straw for the Martinses. But Lutek laughed at him and said, Man, you'll get shot for something like this. That terrified Valerik, and he never spoke about it again. You see, he was a child, a country boy, a little dumb, how do you say, a little limited. He never thought that fire meant sabotage. He did not connect these concepts in his head. He was always so naive. Naive. A child. Although Michal himself did not seem to be particularly religious and regarded Valerian's talk of God with a degree of skepticism, his friend's faith would turn out to play a very important part in his life. He describes a certain day in the camp. You know... The work was so hard that at one point I thought, I can't take it anymore and want to leave the cart and go on the post chain. Then that means shot on the run. <sighs> but it's not like people want to run away. That's quite impossible. For example, hiding and running away later, maybe. But running away through the chain of posts is impossible. There is no way. If someone steps onto the line between the posts, he's already shot. If someone is sick and doesn't want to live anymore, he goes in that direction. A few steps, and he's already shot. At the beginning, the guard gets two days' leave. Escape attempt thwarted. Later, they don't get any more, because it happens too often. They can't give that much leave. But this time, it was really bad with me. No more courage. And I left the wheelbarrow, and went to the chain of posts. 
And Valeric sees that, comes running, pulls me back by the arm and says, God will help. Oh, he was always with God. And he says to me, God will help, but you and I have to stay together. Come back. And I went back. Valerian had returned a favor and saved Mihao's life. And Mihao lived. He lived through Auschwitz. He lived through Neuengamme. He lived to see the end of the war and the inglorious disintegration of the National Socialist dreams. Sometimes before December 1941, Mihao lost contact with Valerian as Valerian would be sent to a different commando with an easier job. A Polish inmate by the name of Stefan Kuma told Mihao that Valerian was taken out of Neuengamme on the transport number 4767. This would be the last that Mihao would hear of him until 44 years later, when historian Schmink Gustavos would visit him and tell him what happened next. On the Wednesday of the 8th of April 1942, at 1.30, Valerian was brought to the Untersuchungshaftanstalt Bremen, a prison specialized in pre-trial detention. On the 11th of April, he had his first hearing. Historian and professor of law Schmin Gustavus writes, What should have happened without delay, according to the Code of Criminal Procedure, the review of the arrest by a judge, was delayed in this case for almost a year. No judge, no public prosecutor, no defense attorney took offense at this. No one dared to make inquiries with the Gestapo. This criminal delay caused by the whims of the Gestapo nearly killed Valerian several times and condemned him to hard labor for nine months without having been reviewed by a judge or backed by any guilty verdict in a court of law. The Gestapo was, and not for the first or last time, openly meddling with and undermining the judicial branch with impunity. Valerian was handed the indictment in his cell, but a document was written in German. Valerian could only speak a few words of the language by then, and certainly not enough to understand the complicated legal jargon contained within the document. The only words he could understand for certain were his own name. The paper was his only companion for the next 10 days. Then, at 9.15 in the morning, he received a visit from a certain Mr. Lazarevitz, detective superintendent and Gestapo interpreter, who spent 45 minutes translating the document to him. It is unknown whether the interpreter took the time to explain the charges in a way in which Valerian would have understood. The boy was someone with an incomplete education and from a very humble background, and it is not clear whether he acquired a proper understanding of the gravity of the charges, what they meant, and what legal recourses he had. Supporting this doubt is the fact that two days before the main hearing, Valerian's lawyer, Dr. Bechtel, wrote the following frantic letter. In the criminal case against Vrubel Valerian, for crimes against the Volksschädling ordinance, etc., I have been appointed defense counsel for the defendant. He declares that he has received the indictment and has understood its contents. However, communication with him is difficult. For example, he cannot say whether he has anything to say in his defense and is not able to say anything coherently about how he came to the decision to commit the crime. Therefore, it is also not possible to reach a verdict on what can be presented in favor of the defendant regarding his ability to see the wrongfulness of the act and to assess its consequences. Since the management of the remand prison does not have a person who speaks Polish, I asked the interpreter of the secret state police to arrange for him to give me a time tomorrow in the course of the day when he will be able to visit the accused together with me. Historian Schmink Gustavus writes that a pleading by the defense counsel did not reach the case file until the day of the main hearing. It bears the date of the same day and is likely to have been dictated into the typewriter in the morning before the appointment. The prosecution indicted Valerian under two ordinances. The first one was the Verordnung gegen Volksschädliger, in English, the Ordinance Against Human Pests. This document was released on the 5th of September 1939, only days after Germany's invasion of Poland. The specific paragraph which the prosecutor used against Valerian was paragraph 3, which reads as follows. Crimes dangerous to the public. Any person who commits arson or any other dangerous crime and thereby harms the power of resistance of the German people shall be punished by death. 
The so-called power of resistance of the German people was however never specifically defined, and this was intentional. By leaving this concept vague and nebulous, the National Socialists gave the judges full discretionary powers to decide by themselves what definition to apply, and opened the way for them to mete out a death penalty with a much greater ease than the Reich Criminal Code would have ever allowed. The defense challenged the application of this ordinance to Valerian's particular case. All that Valerian had done was set fire to a barn, not to a munitions factory or a hospital, he did not cut telephone lines or poison a water supply. How did setting fire to a barn affect the power of resistance of the German people? How would he have even made the connection in his young mind? Valerian had never expressed any ideological enmity towards Germany and its people. He was neither a spy nor a saboteur. The fact that he tried to run away only six days after arriving in Bremen proves that he had not come there with a nefarious master plan. His end goal had been to return to his parents. The second ordinance Valerian was charged under was the Verordnung über die Strafrechtspflege gegen Polen und Juden in den eingegliederten Ostgebieten. In English, the Ordinance of the Administration of Criminal Justice against Poles and Jews in the Incorporated Eastern Territories. Introduced on the 4th of December 1941, this ordinance was a stab in the ribcage of the German justice system. It prescribed severe punishments, including death, for a large number of offences including sabotage, anti-German fuel attacks, possession of weapons, failure to immediately report knowledge of someone else having possession of weapons, inciting unrest, failure to comply with German orders and decrees, etc. It contained telling statements such as, Poles and Jews cannot reject German judges as biased, or the court and the public prosecutor shall conduct the proceedings on the basis of German criminal procedural law at their own discretion. They may deviate from the provisions of the Judicial Constitution Act and the Reich Criminal Procedure Act where it is expedient for the speedy and urgent conduct of the proceedings. Again, the National Socialists diluted the rigours to which the judicial branch was sworn to and opened a door for abuses which they thoroughly encouraged. Further on in the ordinance, we read that the summary courts may also refrain from imposing punishment and instead pronounce referral to the secret state police. Here, the court is expressly allowed to cede its authority and duty to the cruel whims of the Gestapo. The paragraph relevant to Valerian's case was the following. The death penalty shall be imposed where the law stipulates it. Even when the law does not provide for capital punishment, it shall be imposed if the act is of a particularly low character or is particularly serious for other reasons. In such cases, capital punishment shall also be permissible against juvenile felons. The argument of the prosecution was that Valerian caused the fire with the express purpose of hurting the ill-defined German power of resistance and not because he wanted to be sent home. At first glance, this charge would appear to be the easiest to refute, for one simple reason. The ordinance did not exist at the time Valerian committed the crime. It was released in December 1941, more than seven months after the crime took place. Valerian's lawyer attempted to shield him from this charge by pointing out this fact. Additionally, he wrote that, in the opinion of the defense, the court will have to examine whether the defendant should be acquitted, because at the time of the crime he was mentally and morally incapable of understanding the illegality of the crime or of determining his will in accordance with this understanding. Historian Schmink Gustavus writes that, with these arguments of the defense, the court had built bridges that could have saved the boy from the worst. But Valerian seemed to feel something in the air. Perhaps it was the look on the judges' faces. Perhaps it was something his lawyer had said. Perhaps he had simply come to learn a thing or two about Nazi justice during his long, arduous months in Germany. We will never know. What we do know for certain is that he sat in his cell and wrote a letter to his parents, which he would somehow manage to smuggle out. In it, he tried to gently prepare them for the possibility that he might not come back to them ever again. Valerian's father did everything in his meager power to save his son. He gathered documents and gave them to the Polish police, insisting that his son was underage. How could they kill him if he was only 17? The papers he had gathered in the hopes of saving his child were rejected. There was no point, they said. It is very unlikely 
that Valerian ever found out how hard his father tried to save him. The main hearing took place on the rainy Wednesday of the 8th of July 1942 at 11.45am before the special court, second floor, room 145. The room has not changed much from that day. The same intricate wall panelling, tall vaulted ceilings, church-like windows. Valerian had probably never been inside such a luxurious room before in his entire life. Even the chairs on which the judges were sitting were a work of art, finely carved, upholstered in leather, each of them bearing the tenets, do right, fear God, fear no man. The members of the court who had gathered to decide Valerian's fate were Regional Court Director Dr. Warnecken as chairman, Regional Court Director Dr. Hoyman, Regional Court Councillor Landwehr as associate judge, Commissioned Prosecutor Dr. Zorn as an official of the Public Prosecutor's Office and Chief Judicial Inspector Illing as Clerk of the Court Office. Meta and Louisa Martins took the stand as witnesses and described the events which took place on that April day in 1941. The case unfolded once again, from Valerian's arrival to the moment of his arrest. The prosecution requested a death penalty. The defence requested a milder punishment. It took Dr. Warnecke and the rest of the judges two hours and 25 minutes to stand up and condemn Valerian to death in the name of the German people. The arguments employed by the court are stretching the margins of the law, as historian and law professor Schmin Gustavus notes. In order to be able to apply the ordinance against people's pests, the court had to affirm the facts of aggravated arson, paragraph 306, item 2 of the Criminal Code, this was only possible if the perpetrator had set fire to a building serving for the dwelling of people. But Valerian had not set the fire inside the house. He had set it inside the barn. Although the barn was connected to a house by a small corridor, there was a clear delimitation between the two buildings. The declaration of the defendant, he believed that he would be sent home if the barn burned down, only makes sense if he assumed that the residential building would burn down as well. The barn alone was of no use to him. The defendant, despite his youth, was aware of and, in the opinion of the court, realized that when the barn burned down, the house would burn down as well, and he wanted this to happen, otherwise he would not have carried out his plan, since he had been planning it since noon. He has therefore deliberately set fire to a building used for human habitation. According to the prevailing case law, it is enough to set fire to the barn with the intention to set fire to the house as well. He is therefore guilty of the crime of aggravated arson under paragraph 306 of the Criminal Code. If that had been the case, then why hadn't Valerian simply set fire directly inside the house instead of the barn, if the barn was useless to him? How could they know for certain what somebody like Valerian was thinking? He was also accused of having affected the defensive ability of the German people. Not only did the judges consider the farm to be essential to the war industry somehow, but also added that, had it burned down, there would have been a significant problem with supplying the local population with food. They do not explain how they reached this conclusion. The Martins farm was by no means the only farm in the neighbourhood. Despite his youth, and despite the fact that he seems to be somewhat delayed in his mental development, the court is convinced that the defendant had the insight to recognize the consequences for the resistance of the German people. At the very least, he expected it. He accepted it, even though he did not strive for it. How would have someone like Valerian, who was very young, came from an extremely humbled and sheltered background, spoke no German, and who had only been in Germany for a little over two weeks at that time, be aware of the ill-defined legal concept of the defensive ability of the German people. It's interesting to note that the judges seem to believe that Valerian was mentally somewhat behind, that his mind was younger than his body. Some elements we have heard so far would seem to support this theory. His extreme naivety, his failure to finish fourth grade, his inability to think things through, the utterly childish impression he made in Neuengamme and in the courtroom. And yet, although the judges openly acknowledge this disadvantage, they do not seem to wish to take it into account, even though it could have made a great difference in the verdict. 
They do not order an examination to determine if they are correct, and they instead jump to their own conclusions. There was one last fact that protected Valerian. He had been underage when he committed the crime. He was still underage as he was standing there in front of the judges. But the judges circumvent this by declaring that, although the defendant is still a juvenile within the meaning of the Juvenile Court Act, he had just reached the age of 16 when he committed the act, the Juvenile Court Act does not apply to him as a Pole. The provisions of the German Juvenile Court Act were created solely for the young German in order to mould him into a proper national comrade through educational measures. With one fell swoop, the judges simply removed not just Valerian's protection as a minor, but by extension, the protection of all children between the ages of 14 and 17 in the world who are not German. The fact that the Ordinance on the Administration of Criminal Justice against Poles and Jews in the incorporated Eastern Territories did not exist in April 1941 was also overcome through a baffling set of mental gymnastics. The judges simply declared their law retroactive. It shall be applied retroactively also in accordance with the implementing provisions with the consent of the Public Prosecutor's Office, which shall be readily understood to mean that the Public Prosecutor's Office has brought charges on the basis of the provisions of the regulation. Mr. Bechtel, Valerian's lawyer, does not give up and immediately enters a plea for clemency. He stresses the unfortunate circumstances of the boy's life, his delayed mental development, his small and fragile body, and the insignificant damages he inflicted on the barn. There can be no doubt that even if the act of the accused had been a complete success and the property of Mrs. Martins had been completely destroyed, neither the material damage nor the impression of the fire had in any way affected the moral resistance of those directly concerned or of the population. Even at that time, after numerous air raids, some of which were heavy, damaging events of a completely different magnitude than have ever been recorded before were and still are part of this. It's almost as if he could not believe that someone like Valerian was really being sentenced to death for something like that. The judges did not argue with that view. They reasoned that if Valerian had been brought to them right away and not locked up in a concentration camp for nine months, then he would have been judged before the ordinance regarding Poles and Jews came into power and he would not have received the death penalty. The fact that the law did not exist at the time when the boy committed the crime and that they chose, of their own will and judgment, to make it retroactive, even though they could have simply chosen to stick to the letter of the law, seems to have escaped them. However, in a surprising move, they do favour clemency. Further good news came from the prosecutor, who was also in favour of mercy. Just like the judges, he seemed to agree that the turning point was Valerian's delayed appearance before the court, and furthermore adds that, in a personal interrogation of the convicted, which has now taken place approximately about one and a quarter years after the commission of the crime, the undersigned got the impression that even today, the convicted is not only a young man with a purely childlike appearance, Vrubel weighs a hundred pounds with clothes and has a delicate body, he cried during the interrogation, but that he is also to be regarded as thoroughly youthful in terms of his mental maturity. The undersigned is aware that death sentences against Poles must, as a rule, be carried out ruthlessly. On the other hand, he does not consider it appropriate to inflict a death sentence on a boy. What caused the court to suddenly favour clemency, after insisting on bending over backwards to impose the death penalty? Or, the better question, why were these men so hell-bent on sending Valerian to the executioner's block in the first place? None of them had a professional reputation for harshness. So what happened? One possible answer is fear. Fear happened. As Schmin Gustavus writes in his book, The Homesickness of Valerian Vrubel, A Boy in Court, 1941-1942. The terror verdicts of the special courts are in their own way also an expression of fear, not only of the imminent collapse of the Third Reich, but also of the judges for their own future. At the same time that Valerian was sentenced, there were reports of plans by the Nazi leadership to abolish criminal justice altogether. Such rumours could not have failed to influence anxious minds, just like the widespread concern, especially among lawyers, to stand out or even get in trouble. The transfer because of unreliability or lack of sharpness of action 
could have meant for the individual judge the end of the so-called Ukarstellung. This means the independence and thus conscription into the Wehrmacht, perhaps even deployment to the front. The fear for the post will therefore have made some people capable of things that were perhaps unthinkable to them before the war. Without resistance, the judiciary bowed to the pressure of the Nazi leadership and executed a criminal justice against foreigners that hardly differed from what happened officially under the government of Himmler's SS a little later. Nevertheless, the dissatisfaction of the Nazi leadership with the cumbersome judicial machinery persisted. The proceedings took too long, tied up too many workers, produced too much paperwork. The Nazification of the judicial system poisoned and weakened it and turned the court of law into a court of wolves and cowards. Valerian was sacrificed on the altar of their spinelessness. The clemency plea ended up on the desk of Dr. Roland Freisler, the representative of Otto Tierak, the Reich Minister of Justice, and the particularly ruthless judge. He was a fanatical National Socialist, a participant in the Wannsee Conference, and one of the most ghoulish figures in the Nazi judicial pantheon. Here he had a plea for clemency for an underage boy, supported by the court and by the prosecution. But Valerian was a Pole. And for such an ardent Nazi like Freisler, the Polish people were just something to use and then destroy. Without a single justification, he rejected the plea from his high and lofty seat in Berlin. If during the first part of Valerian's imprisonment matters were delayed considerably, now the process reaches a terrifying speed. He was sent to Hamburg shortly afterwards, on the 24th of August at 1pm. At 7pm, he was told that he would leave this world early the next day at 6.15 in the morning. We have a written report regarding his last night, written at the request of Head Prosecutor Seidel. Vrubel calmly received the sentence and asked if he could not atone for his crime in another way, otherwise he would never be able to return to his parents. From this report, we find out that Valerian asked the prison guards to photograph him so he could send a memento to his parents, because he knew that they had no pictures of him. When the German authorities contacted his mother and showed her Valerian's mugshot, she begged them to let her keep it. The family could not afford photographs. One time, a photographer came to the village, but Valerian kept running away and hiding, wouldn't let himself be photographed. In a sad turn of events, the only known photographs of Valerian would end up being those taken by the police. They would never end up in his parents' hands. Here we have the last picture taken of him, the day before his execution. He looks very different from the wide-eyed boy who appeared in his first mugshot. He is standing in his black prison uniform, his shoulder slump, his hat in his hand. He looks defeated. He said that if he had to die at the age of 40, it would not be so bad, but to die so young was very hard and he had had no experience of life. His behaviour and his words made a very childish impression. Nevertheless, he remained calm and was firmly convinced that God would receive him graciously. This confidence did not give him any feeling of fear. He wrote a letter to his parents the chaplain of the Catholic institution, Father Benin, gave Rubo several pictures of saints which, after he had put his name on them, he gave back to the priest with the request that he send them to his parents. His whole behaviour betrayed, again and again, very strong homesickness. He smoked 25 cigarettes during the night. In the morning, he became agitated for a short while, only to calm down once the chaplain assured him that he would go with him into the execution chamber. At 6.15 on the 25th of August 1942, the National Socialist judicial system saw ghastly crowning of its inhumanity. The little body was picked up at 7.20 in the morning by the Hamburg Anatomical Institute for Educational Purposes. It is not known what happened to it and where it was buried. Nazi Germany had swallowed its victim whole. The newspaper in Bremen announced the death of Valerian that very day, calling it a well-deserved punishment. Polish saboteur executed, crowd another. 
Through the efforts of the Catholic chaplain, Valerian's last letter reached his parents in Falkov. It became the point of a sad little pilgrimage in the town. The people came to the Vrubel house and listened to the letter as it was being read aloud and cried. The next day, others would gather in front of the house and they too would listen to Valerian's last words and shed their tears. Mariana Vrubel was in such agony that she fainted every time she saw the letter, leading her heartbroken husband to burn it to spare her further pain. Mariana spoke often of her boy. She had no photograph of him. She missed him terribly. And yet, she never gave up hope that he might still be alive, that one day she would hear a knock on the door and there he would be, her boy. They were bound together, mother and son, by hope that was cruelly dashed, that they would be reunited. In another act of cruelty, the family was not told why Valerian had been sentenced to death, nor how he had been executed. The only member of his family to ever find out what really happened would be his little sister, who was told the story by Schmin Gustavus in the 80s. And my mother did not want to let him leave. She wanted to keep him by her side, but he said, when I am there I can send you money. He wanted to help the family. The most harrowing was his last letter, the very last one. The father also burned it. In the letter he said goodbye to each of us, one by one. And he wished us that happiness would smile on us. He prayed that his little brother and sister would be happy, as he was not given to be. It was a heartbreaking letter. There was not a single soul who did not cry upon reading it. He wanted so much to be with us and to help us, so that we wouldn't live in such poverty. I remember this letter the most. The paper was full of tears. Even the priest, to whom he confessed before the execution, wrote two letters and said how sorry he was for the child, and that Valerian always begged him and said that he wanted to make up for everything. If only they sent him back to his parents. The last letter might have been burned, but the sister had managed to hide a letter her brother had sent before his main hearing. It spreads on two pages, and what immediately catches the eye is the drawing of a horse on the first page. This boy, knowing that he will most likely die, locked away in an awful place, had somehow found the strength inside himself to create something beautiful for his loved ones. Isn't it a marvellous drawing? Look at how detailed the horse reins are. Look where the soul of an artist was hiding. The second letter, 9th of July, 1942. Dear Mommy and Daddy, brother and little sister. Last words, Valerian Vrubel. Dear mommy and daddy, I write the last words. Words to you that I am not coming home anymore because something difficult happened to me. But I pray to God the Almighty to help me in my last hours, that I can go to confession and to take the Holy Communion. But if I am to live on, I will write you quickly a letter, dear parents, so that you do not worry about me. I will still have one hearing, and what the judge will give me, whether to sit for a long time in prison or death, I do not know yet. I ask you one more time, do not worry about me, because the letter will be sent before my hearing. If I am not going to be alive anymore, I only ask you for a holy mass. I say goodbye to you, dear parents, in my last hour. May you live long, and ask God, he will help you to stay healthy. I write the last words with a holy hand. Good night, dear mommy, daddy, brother, and little sister. Roland Freisler would be crushed to death in his own courthouse on the 3rd of February 1945 during an American air raid over Berlin. The National Socialist dream would end up crumbling in the ashes of history. At a Nuremberg lawyer's trial in 1947, the Ordinance on the Administration of Criminal Justice against Poles and Jews in the incorporated Eastern Territories was classified as a war crime. The German Bundestag repealed all sentences based on it in the 1998 law on the repeal of National Socialist unjust sentences. 
At the request of Valerian's sister and the Bremen Public Prosecutor's Office, the Bremen Regional Court ruled on the legality of the verdict and overturned it in a decision dated November 26, 1987. None of the judges who made a mockery of injustice in Valeria's trial were ever made to answer for their crime. Ernst Landwehr was declared a Mitläufer on the 21st of April 1948 and had to pay a fine of 930 Reichmarks, around a month worth of salary. Who knew redemption could be made so cheap? But not cheap enough for Dr. Hans Neumann and Warnecken, who protested vehemently in a letter against their own equally cheap penalties. It took less than three months after the unconditional surrender before the first attempts were made to restore the former Nazi judges to their offices. Thus, as early as July 27, 1945, Dr. Lachusen, then president of the regional court, demanded in a letter to the court officer of the American military government the reinstatement of various suspended Bremen judges. Among the ten named are the names of Warnecken, Heumann and Landwehr. It can be said of all of them that they have always administered their office in a thoroughly impartial, strictly factual and objective manner, and that they have never allowed themselves to be unduly influenced in their impeccable professional conduct by any political or other instances. It can be said, but it would be a lie. Louisa Martens, the daughter of the Martens widow, died in 2005 at the age of 99. Her great-grandson, Photographer Stefan Vega discovered his family's connection to Valerian's story and turned his research into a project, and then a book, Louisa, Archaeology of an Injustice. In the book, he writes about how he felt when he visited Falkov. Never have I felt more out of place, even if the woman at the local pizza shop is incredibly friendly. Perhaps this is the feeling that is needed to fight against oblivion, a discomfort that not only creeps up on you when you are at the memorials on the grounds of German concentration camps and being directly confronted with the suffering your grandparents, great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents inflicted on their fellow human beings, but rather a universal discomfort that if one's own family lived in Nazi Germany, it is likely to have perpetrators or bystanders in the family who at least profited from the suffering of others, if not directly contributed to it. Nazi Germany would not have been Nazi Germany if there had been as many resistance fighters as families tend to tell. Discomfort is good. Discomfort does not mean guilt and condemnation. Those who are really to blame are most likely not alive anymore. Discomfort means awareness, understanding and not forgetting. Well-used discomfort leads, at best, to dialogue and reconciliation. For me, this project is meant to be a first step towards that. <laughs>